Coming up, a series of launches. Static fire tests. Planet Nine. And Elon drops some hints on his Mars plan. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to Tomorrow, Season 9, Episode 20 for Saturday, June 4th, 2016. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. I'll be joined by the rest of the gang in just a moment. Before that happens, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. If you'd like to find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tm. R O. All right, let's go. <laughs> this is going to be an action-packed epic so uh, let's go ahead and get started <laughs> right into space news. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we've got Jared Head sitting directly to my left. Uh, we've got uh, Space Mike in between. All right. And we've got uh, my beautiful, lovely, and wonderful wife, Carrie Ann, sitting on the end. All right, starting with uh, some space news. Russia deploys another communicate. I'm sorry, GPS satellite. Either shot that with a GoPro, or they have this really cool bend to their uh, to their lightning towers. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's shot with a GoPro. Well, lightning is never straight, Ben. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That happened uh, Sunday, May 29th, in 08:44 Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, that's a Soyuz 21B, and that was a GLONASS M satellite. Uh, the GLONASS M is the second generation of their GLONASS satellites, and it's a navigation system, much like the Global Positioning System in the United States. Uh, they're really only believed to be about eight more of the M series of the GLONASS satellites. The next generation, the K2 GLONASS satellites, is is uh, kind of on deck, but sanctions are making it hard for those to get those up in operational. Uh, so at this point, they're only launching the M series, and they're only doing that when they need to replace something that's gone wrong up in orbit. And think, speaking of things that have gone wrong, Space Mike, you brought to my attention that while this was a successful insertion, there were actually issues uh, bringing it up to uh, bringing it up to space. That's right. The uh, third stage for that, the Block I, actually uh, shut down several seconds early. This is kind of similar to the Atlas launch anomaly where it shut down early. But this is the one of the upper stages. And there was one more upper stage, the Fregat Space Tug, that um, the cool thing about it is it has its own computers that are able to uh, monitor its own live telemetry feed and make adjustments as necessary. So even though uh, the, the Block I, the third stage, failed to, to perform as expected, the Fregat stage was able to compensate and plug in the numbers for that and be able to insert it into its correct orbit so that they could deliver to the satellite successfully. So good job for correcting automatically. It, that is a little bit weird that we've seen a couple of these uh, shortened uh, burns. I'm, there's, I'm sure there's no relation. It's just interesting that they happen so close to each other. Yeah. No, yeah. That's all. Just Neat. All right, uh, moving <laughs> along. <laughs> How neat is that? Uh, moving along, we've got a Long March 4B uh, lofting some Earth viewing satellites. Oh, yeah, that's right. We have about five seconds of footage on this one. This happened Monday, May 30th at 0317 coordinate. That's all you get. 0317 <laughs> coordinate universal time. That's the Zewon uh, 3-2. It's a civilian Earth imaging satellite. It's going to be looking over land. Re yeah, that's it. That's it. You, you know, go ahead and roll it one more time. Roll it one more time. <laughs> And I won't even get through all my notes in this second roll. Uh, uh, land resource surveys, natural disaster prevention, agriculture development, water resources management, and urban planning. Uh, it also had a, uh, I'm sorry, it's the second satellite in a remote sensing mapping system that Ch China's building and trying to build out by 2030. Hey, see, I told you. <laughs> Why do they look like they're going in for surgery while they're in mission control? Like every one of them. Wait, roll it again. It's only going to take us five seconds to get the roll <laughs> yeah. one more time. But there we go. Wait, wait, so what are you talking about here? There's okay this, and then I assume yep. what's mission control for them? This. Sure. Yep. They're all in like. White yeah. Lab why are they? Because uh, right? it looks very there's formal. Like chef hats on. Is I, that, I mean, is that what's going on? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. It yeah. It's basically a GIF at this point. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> like, maybe it's kind of like, it's like a tuxedo shirt, you know? Um, it's they, like, I want to be formal, but I'm also here to party. Uh, they've also... I they also, find it interesting. I thought it was... 
Yeah. They also have two microsatellites owned by SatLogic, it's a Buenos Aires company. Uh, the first two members of the Constellation uh, were just launched on that vehicle right there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> and they hope to have uh, uh, up to 25. Uh, four more of them are going to jo uh, join them uh, later this year. They're called NewSat1 and NewSat2. Uh, each one of those satellites it has three cameras on it to capture imagery in color, infrared, and the hyperspectrum. Uh, and it's going to give them analysis of Earth. So, cool. Uh, that Sweet. seems to be another kind of burgeoning... <laughs> okay, you can stop rolling it. Lur <laughs> says that they're military so that they're in uniform. I, I guess I just... I didn't know. That's that why I asked sense. the question. It seems I get, like yeah. they have different uniforms, too, at different launch centers. Because mm -hmm. I've seen like that before, where they have the like the kind of chef's hats on. And then at other launch centers, they have the blue coats on, and, and they don't seem to be wearing hats. Coordination. So. Yeah, oh, no, the no, blue no, coats, like, I remember. It's like which launch center it is. I think it's like Star Trek, right? You have a different colored uniform based on your position. So if it's right. a science mission, you're in yellow? Yeah. Uh, or no, security? So, so, so let's see, your science missions would be blue, <laughs> uh, yellow would be command, right? So Is if it? it's a command mission, I have no idea what white would be. But yeah, yeah. all right, cool. Uh, that's pretty cool. Where white go would be that? like craft services. <laughs> that's oh, terrible. Sad. That's, that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> all right, and the final launch this last week, a Russian Rokot launching Geo 1K to IK2. <sighs> There's some Boom. yellow smoke for you. Ah! <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a Saturday, June 4th at 1400 Coordinated Universal Time. Again, I'm pretty sure that's a GoPro. Uh, uh, there was some environmental protesting to that launch. Uh, Can't due imagine. To the, <laughs> yeah, due to the hydrazine contamination from the spent second stage uh, coming back. Uh, that, like I said, was the GOIK2 number 12L that just rolls right off the tongue. Uh, it will, it's going to be investigating Earth's gravitational field. It's going to gain data on the global displacement of Earth's crust, uh, along with the study of sea surface heights and tidal movements. Uh, here's another uh, another view. Wait, did you just loop it, or is that another view? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. another view. Yeah, that's right. I, I think there are like three or four views in this particular clip. Um, it's going to be put into a sun-synchronous orbit, and it's going to be joined by another spacecraft and then hopefully not too distant future, which was kind of their plan all along. So there you go. Mm. That was uh, the launch coverage that happened this last week. Uh, speaking of things that are about to launch... Well, Grumpy Space, is, that makes me hold my breath from here. <laughs> 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 yeah. Don't breathe the fumes. Right? Hypergolic fuels. Oh, like, you just don't want it. Yeah, those orange... When you see rockets in those orange clouds, uh, you just kind of hope that it's the sun illuminating it from behind and not actually. You know, I've heard that hypergolic fuels smell like fish, but nobody's ever been able to <laughs> live to tell us what no, it actually no smells been able to like. Confirm like that. fish! <laughs> What's it's it smell like? like? Oh, it smells like... Yeah, it's like a Monty Python sketch, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 That'd be a terrible sketch, actually. Uh, no, uh, uh, anyway, uh, go on. All yeah. right. <laughs> oh, well. All right, Space Mike, talk to me about uh, <laughs> some uh, uh, orbital AT ATK. So, yes, yeah, speaking of things that might be launching in the near future, uh, orbital ATK has completed a very crucial step in returning their Antares rocket to flight. This was a static fire test that they completed at the uh, um, uh, designated Mars, the uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia, and we have the footage of that successful static fire test. And, 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 okay. Oh, <laughs> right. yes. oh. Okay. <laughs> this is completely <laughs> I do, uh, by the way, all right, the video admin in, in me is going to uh, make two analysis here. First, that is a CMOS sensor with a rolling shutter. Uh, I can tell you that. Second, this camera also is a CMOS sensor with a rolling shutter. And that first camera was almost certainly a pan tilt zoom camera in an enclosure that couldn't deal with the vibe. <laughs> All right, continue, Wait, Mike. Oh, my gosh, rockers. <laughs> uh, but in any case, this test took place on Tuesday, May 31st at Pad 0A. And um, this was, was completed ahead of its uh, return to flight, like I said. And with this Antares, uh, this is actually a stage designated the Antares 230, which replaces the AJ-26 engines, which are reworked NK-33s from the Soviet moon program, and replaced those with Russian-made RD-191, or excuse me, 181 engines. And uh, because of that, 
that upgrade over the Antares 100, they actually have quite a bit of a performance increase. And even though uh, I believe that they're looking at around a 13% in, or excuse me, a 25% increase in the performance that this rocket will be able to do with these new engines. But the cool thing is, is they don't have to rework the tanking or a lot of the plumbing on it because it uses the same mixture ratio as the AJ-26s. So there was minimal changes that they needed to do on the core stage other than being able to, you know, integrate these new engines. And they're single uh, nozzle, uh, single chamber engines, and they're using two of them on each Antari stage. And something that I found interesting is that this particular rocket that completed the static fire test is not the rocket that is going to be used on their next launch, hopefully next month, returning uh, the Antares to flight and launching a Cygnus to the International Space Station. This one will be used on the, the following Cygnus mission, which is uh, for their CRS-7 mission, I believe. And this one is their uh, CRS-5, or OA-5 is how, how they designate it. And uh, whatever the data they glean from this test, they're going to make modifications to the core stage for that rocket, which will be launching next month. And then this one that we saw do that static fire test will be launching hopefully later this year. So very good news, and hopefully everything goes well, and they don't have any more problems like they did uh, back in October of 2014. <laughs> Uh, Green Jim 2 in the chat room is wondering, so what's happening to the remaining N1 engines? Well, um, I believe that Aerojet Rocketdyne still has a couple of them left, and I don't know what they're planning to do with them. Um, they might try to sell them back or maybe just uh, use them as museum pieces. But there are still uh, several remaining NK-33s and the different uh, variants of engines that were on the N1 rocket, the Russian moon rocket, and they're using those NK-33s on a version of the Soyuz rocket. And once they're done with those, they're going to be replacing it with the RD-191 engine, which is a version of this 181 engine. It's a single no uh, nozzle engine, uh, but it's it also has a little bit higher performance than the 181 does. And they're already using that one on the Angara 1 rocket. And uh, once they use up the remaining NK-33s that they can use, some of them they can't, uh, then they'll re be replacing them with new engines that are based on the same design. I'll take one. <laughs> if, they, if they don't want one, I'll take one. Make it a copy yeah. sample. Yeah, I could. Or I could use it. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Yeah. Could use it too. You got a 50-50 so. shot of it working correctly. Yeah, that's fine. That's good <laughs> odds right. for me. Uh, I did want to say thank you, Space Mike, for using the term static fire. I actually wrote in the, hot, in the notes, I'm like, hot fire is a dumb term. Uh, but uh, <laughs> for whatever reason, Orbital ATK calls their static fire as a hot fire. Uh, yeah. But obviously, it's a hot fire. All, well, I, I was about to say all fire is hot, but that's mostly true. Okay. It is, it's yeah. true -ish. <clears throat> The way I think of it is static fires are usually like what is referred to like the full up test where they have a full rocket on the pad doing it. I think of hot fire test as just like a single engine test that they can do at any test hand. So. Yeah, but then that would have been a static fire based on that description. Yeah. Right? But they referred to it as a hot fire. Yeah. Anyhow, I think the I think hot fire is a stupid term. They're basically <laughs> they're interchangeable terms, right? Oh, they basically man. mean the same we thing. We should get the International yeah. Rocket Union in here to get the nomenclature set correctly. We should. We totally so. should. Yes, that is, needs to be a thing that happens. All right, <laughs> moving on. Uh, more rocket launch geekery, Jared. Yes, big time geekery too, because not only is this just a big rocket, this is a big payload that a big rocket is taking up. And Ariane Space's Ariane Five is getting ready to launch on June eighth at. 2030 Greenwich Mean Time, uh, or excuse me, UTC. I'm sorry, Coordinated Universal Time. Oh, I blew it, which is 1.30 uh, p.m. Pacific Daylight Time here for us on the uh, Best Coast. Uh, there's going to be a 45 Best minute... Best Coast? I've never heard that yeah. before. Well, there Boom. you go. Yeah, that's right. That's awesome. Turkey? Turkey? Oh, turkey. <laughs> All right, so um, there's going to be a 45-minute window available uh, for this. Now, the thing about this launch is that this is going to be the heaviest unclassified payload ever put into geosynchronous transfer orbit. This is going to be 9,840 kilograms, which if you include the total mass of things like the adapters and the other computers and systems on board, the total amount of mass allocated for the payload is 10,000 731 kilograms. This is really, really heavy, and it'll be a dual satellite launch with Echo Star 18 weighing in at 6.3 metric tons and Brisat, which will weigh in at 3,540 kilograms. Now, it'll be targeting an orbit of 250 kilometers by 35,766 kilometers tilted six degrees to the Earth's equator. Nerd. Yeah, well, you know, hey. 
Got to do it. Uh, Bree said, uh, we'll be supporting banking services in Indonesia, and Echostar 18 will provide services for Dish Network subscribers in North America. Wait, wait, wait. What's it doing for banking services? Um, like, like relay, like telecommunications relay for banking services. So like so money goes up to the satellite and comes back down? Sort of. Um, actually, so it's, it's just really, data? It's, yeah, it's data relay for banks, um, but the most important part of the data relay for the banks is essentially timestamps. Ah, so that's why they want scary to do accurate it. timing exactly and, and so, encryption yes and encryption as well and also you know um, you may not necessarily want to send something over a landline you can just send it up and, and do it that way especially well. with the whole so, controversy a couple of years ago about all the uh, stock traders um, like yeah. uh, tapping into the landline so that they could get that millisecond extra notice whenever um, stocks fluctuated so that they could you know buy or sell you know that fraction of a second faster than their competitors and you yeah. know ever since that was outlawed, I feel like this is might be a way of getting around that whole yeah, thing. Just anyway, a little bit. Just, hmm. yeah, and just to note, know. this is the uh, 230th Ariane family rocket launch, and this will be the 86th Ariane 5 to launch as well. So, nice. um, continuing to roll on. All right, let's talk about cool. some new spacecraft, Space Mike. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a new Soyuz spacecraft that is uh, going to be launching very soon. This is the Soyuz MS spacecraft. And uh, with this, they, they are it's the final planned upgrade of the Soyuz spacecraft before moving on to their new Federation capsule in the 2020s. And some of the upgrades on this particular vehicle include more efficient solar panels, a modified docking and attitude control engine positions, uh, or, or in other words, changing where some of the thrusters are mounted so that they'll have extra redundancy during docking and deorbit burns. But they also have a new KERS approach and docking system, which weighs half as much and consumes a third of the power of the previous system. That's, that's a huge increase. It also has a new computer, which is also about one-eighth the weight of the previous computer. Or the new one, rather, where it weighs 8.3 kilograms versus 70 kilograms that the previous computer weighed. So that's also a huge increase. Um, it also has a new uh, unified digital command and telemetry system, so that, that way they can tap into the telemetry via satellite and control the spacecraft even when it's out of sight of ground tracking stations. Uh, it also pro provides the crew with position data when it's out of the range of uh, the, the ground tracking range, and if they need to do any corrections, in, if, you know, if something weird happens, they have the information they need. It also has improved uh, GLONASS or, or GPS systems for accurate location during the uh, rescue and search and rescue operations after the Soyuz lands. So so this is very cool, but the whole thing with this is it was originally supposed to launch on June 24th. It may get pushed back to July 7th due to a problem with the control system. Uh, after reports about the problem were made on Wednesday of, of this past week, the next day on Thursday, Roscosmos made an official statement saying that a decision on when to launch the spacecraft won't be made until Monday, giving the manufacturer Energia a couple more days to correct the, dig the, the issue and hopefully not have to uh, have a delay. Because if there is a delay, um, then they're going to have to reschedule a lot of other vehicles. There's a Progress that was supposed to be launching after this Soyuz, um, also a Cygnus vehicle last month, uh, or next month, which I, which I talked about earlier. And there's also a Dragon spacecraft that are supposed to launch next month for that as well. Uh, the next crew for that that's going to be launching, um, uh, we have a, a picture of them. And, and uh, from left to right, we have Anatoly uh, Ivanishin from uh, Roscosmos, Kate Rubens from NASA, and Takuya Onishi from uh, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. So, very cool, and uh, hopefully they uh, don't have any more problems with that, and the first flight of this new version of the Soyuz goes well, and uh, they're able to reap all the benefits of, of all these, uh, um, especially all the systems that weigh a lot less. That might mean that they'll be able to carry some more supplies and maybe even move things around so that they have a little bit more elbow room. That would be great. <laughs> Uh, Space Mike uh, from the chat room, Lur is asking, will they be reusing components with other new capsules? Well, they sometimes use uh, some, some components from the, the landed Soyuz capsules. They might be reusing some of those, but I, I think that you might be referring to their, to their future version, the, the Federation capsule. And as far as I know with that, they're going to be using the same uh, docking systems. They're going to be using the same types of thrusters on it, although in different configurations. Um, and a lot of the computer systems that they're testing now, kind of catching up to the, the digital age, are going to be on their next version. Although the way that it's shaped and, and the way that it's going to be built is going to be completely different. Nice. All right. Thank you, Space Mike. Jared, I hear our son is a thief. Yes, it may quite <laughs> well be a thief. And actually... 
There is a proposal from a group of scientists from Lund University in Sweden that the hypothetical Planet Nine... <laughs> All right, we're going to pause. Uh, so you were giggling during Mike's last segment in yes. case your microphone picked that up. The reason he was giggling is I went through every instance in his show notes where he said Planet Nine and wrote Planet Ten instead. Yes. Indicating Pluto is still a planet. Yeah, because... Let's make Pluto great again. Someone so, is he, still a Neanderthal did. over here and doesn't so. understand the concept of nomenclature. So he didn't, he didn't notice that I had done this right until he scrolled in his show notes. He was getting ready for his thing and like he started noticing everything said Planet 10 and he just busted out laughing. So if you heard his mic, if you heard him giggling while Mike was talking, that is why. I'm just going to say this right now, which is that this week, one of the dwarf planets that we know of, 20, uh, 2007 QR10. What um, a great name. We recently had, to, this week we had to revise just how big it was because we realized that it was actually reflecting less less light than we expected, which means that it has to be even bigger in order for it to reflect that amount of light. Mm. So we ended up, they ended up saying this is a dwarf planet and this is Mike Brown and his team, the same people who caused Pluto to lose their uh, Pluto status. Boo! Pluto, when it lo lost its planet status uh, when Eris was discovered. Um, and they are saying that they are not going to wait for the International Astronomical Union to start designating what is a dwarf planet and what may be a, uh, just a Kuiper Belt object. They're just going to start using the nomenclature however they want to. So there's this big showdown now that's probably going to happen sometime <laughs> later this year. Nerd fight! Especially in November when the International Astronomical Union meets where they're going to have a showdown on nomenclature. And this may be the, uh, the battle to end all battles in terms of what Pluto will be classified. Yeah. Which nerd will rule them Just all? Basically. <laughs> by the way, by the way, if you call Pluto a planet, yes. there are 94 additional objects that fit the criteria that Pluto does. So you will have to call those planets as well. I'm cool with that. All so right. if you're down with 105 planets yeah, the, in our solar system. It's like a bigger party. Or excuse me, 104, then you know, that's how it works. Yeah, because our I'm solar not, system's way more awesome now. And you know, I'm, always, I'm still of the opinion that even our current definition of a planet makes no sense because you literally have something <laughs> Jupiter and Mercury in the same category and that's just like, yeah. what the heck. So we really need to work on that. But for now, we will use the nomenclature. So planet nine. <laughs> It's not what it says in your show notes. Yeah, it, it clearly I, says Planet 10, Jared. <laughs> All right, so... Um a vast majority of stars, they actually form in clusters. They don't really form all by themselves. They form as like groups. So every once in a while, these stars will actually get very close to each other where stuff that may be around them, like planets or asteroids and comets and Kuiper belt objects and the Oort cloud of that star um, may actually be influenced by the gravitational pull of another star. Now, uh, the team of scientists at Lund University in Sweden actually ran computer models and discovered that if you have a star come close enough to the sun, it could pull a exoplanet that may be around that star and put it into the expected orbit that planet nine would be in. So there is sort of this hypothesis now being floated around out there that planet nine may actually be a exoplanet from another star system. Huh. So that would essentially mean that, um, well, first of all, we'd have to find Planet Nine, and that's what we're doing right now, and we're using uh, the Keck and the Subaru telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii to look for them. Basically, the best telescopes in the world, exactly the type of telescope you want to have looking for them. So we're expecting sometime in the next 18 months to either confirm or or disprove um, the existence of Planet Nine. Either way that goes, it will be an interesting result. So if we do find Planet Nine, what, was, what will that evidence point to as to whether is it a body that formed in our own solar system and got ejected um, out there like they think where uh, Jupiter and Saturn kind of acted like bullies um, with this planet. And <laughs> that seems like and, something they would do. And they flung are mean it out. planets. Yeah, they're quite mean. Um, or was it an actual planet that formed around another star and we have a captured exoplanet in our solar system? So if it turns out, if we have a captured exoplanet in our solar system, we have an exoplanet that we can go study within that our own right. lifetime. We're like, we don't have to fly an interstellar mission in order to do that. We can actually well, go to an I mean, let's be clear, within our lifetime, how long is it going to take to get there? Um, well, if you want to use an ion, a pretty powerful ion drive with a, with a nuclear reactor driving it, you could probably get to it within about 30 years. All right, so you get to it in 30 years, and then uh, what's the speed of light um, delay at that point? Um, it would just be about... I want to say something on the order of 
roughly 11 to 12 hours. Okay, that's something not, like that. That's doable. So, yes. so 30 years, 35, so about 40 years to yeah. do something like that. Yeah. So that is barely within it. Well, at least barely within my lifetime. It's definitely within the operational lifetime of a spacecraft. I guess is the way to put it. Okay, but so. I may not be on this planet anymore. You may I mean. not. Yeah. So okay, you'll probably be on another planet. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, that's a great segue. There you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, we're gonna. G- <laughs> Oh, uh, for some whatever reason, it just got very awkward for some reason. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. It's All like right. a Michael We're going to we're take a uh, quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, other planets. Whoa. <laughs> okay, go back to the other uh, image. There you go. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't know what happened there, but that's great. And welcome, <laughs> welcome back to the show. I tar redacted. <laughs> yeah, something. Uh, before we get started with this uh, segment, I did want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of Tomorrow's who helped make this seg- segment happen. Words go here. Uh, these are people who contributed at least ten dollars to this specific episode. We've also got people who have contributed five dollars or more to this specific episode. These are the tomorrow producers. Each one of those different levels gets different rewards. Head on over to Patreon.com/tmro for all the different le- uh, reward le- uh, reward levels. And <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Hey, now, before we get into our main topic, we're wearing these shirts. What's going on with that? Yeah, so uh, I was up at a astronomy conference last weekend in Big Bear called the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference. Um, and it is open to the public, and it happens every Memorial Day weekend, and it's awesome because during the day there are incredible lectures. So if you've ever wanted to know um, what would be the perfect telescope for you, how do I get, inter- how do I get into astroimaging, and even uh, paper proposals being presented up there as as well. Um, so it's basically an, an astronomy nerd's dream during the day and then at night it's dark skies. You could see the Milky Way with your naked eyes and it's absolutely amazing. And we all take our telescopes out at night. We go do imaging. We do observation. We do incredible stuff. I have a question. Sure. If you have seminars all day long mm-hmm. and then night observation all night long. Yes. When do you sleep? Not. We don't. <laughs> you, don't you just don't. He so. did say that the conference part was an astronomer's dream. So. <laughs> yeah, there is that. So it was fun? So. You had fun? I, I will admit that a lot of the, the panels and stuff start at like noon. <laughs> so that way you can sleep at least three or four hours before you go, which is basically what I did all weekend long. So yeah, that was lots of fun. And I bought I bought a shirt mm-hmm. um, for it, matching shirts, because there's always an official shirt for the conference um, every year. And it's from a company called Infinities. And they uh-huh. actually they actually uh-huh. they actually make scientific uh, apparel, nice. if you will. So basically, get your nerd uh, your nerd fashion on uh-huh. um, with them. And do they do, they do custom things? Can they do something for tomorrow? Uh, maybe. Uh-huh. I guess you could ask them. Cool. So that'd be pretty cool. And there you can find them at i n f i n i. Sorry, that was really hard. Dash tees t e e s dot com, and you can get their uh, you can get their. Really Ooh, awesome, you, cool yeah. scientific uh, shirts there, and I think it just got thrown into the uh, chat room. So, cool. yeah, pretty cool stuff. If we're so. smart, we'll remember to put it in the show notes. But uh, yeah, I may not. It's all. It's that. cool. We got it. All right, and actually, before so also before we get into our main topic, uh, where are you going next week? Oh, next week I will be at LDRS 35, which LDRS stands for Large Dangerous Rocket Ships. <laughs> and I'm so excited. It is basically the global meetup of h- people who do high power rocketry, like myself. Basically, instead of those little small, like little SDs or Quest um, rockets that kids play with, I'm sorry, um, that people play with, uh, we I had, actually. No, I had that as a kid. Yeah. I totally did that. Yeah, like, I have a couple uh, too, yeah. but I don't, I'm above that now. Um, mm-hmm. The. the 
high so power rocketry true. is basically H motors and above, so basically 40 pounds of thrust or more out of your rocket, or like uh, three and a half pounds or more um, in weight with your rocket. Um, so we'll be flying everything up to M motors, which are putting out a couple thousand pounds of thrust. Um, so basically, sometimes the only thing separating these people from NASA is that they don't work for NASA. <laughs> um, is a good way to do it. And uh, we'll actually be doing next week's show. Or I will be. Yeah, you'll doing, be live. I will be live next week out on the lake bed at Lucerne Dry Lake. This is um, either a brilliant idea or yes. a terrible idea. You, we're going to find out next week. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be awesome. Just to let you know, LDRS 35 is it's free to be a spectator, and it's also free to camp on the lake bed out there. So if you actually want to go to LDRS, you can. You just have to uh, be ready for the fact that you are in the Mojave Desert in June. So. And you need to be able to run quickly, just in case. Yes, you do need to be up and and able to move out of the way, um, as I have had to do several times um, before <laughs> out there, just in case something goes wrong with a rocket. So. All right, cool. I'm ex yeah. I'm excited for that. That's I'm very excited show. too, and I still I need to build my rocket. So, yeah. <laughs> so. All right, uh, let's get into our main topic this week. Uh, Elon was at the Recode conference. He was one of the guest speakers, and uh, they spent not an insignificant amount of time talking about SpaceX. We're not going to cover all of that because it was a good it was a good chunk of time where he talked about SpaceX. I actually would recommend heading over to uh, just hit YouTube and search for uh, Elon Recode, and um, you'll be able to find the whole. I think it was like hour and a half. I don't remember yeah, hour it was hour a really and a half. Long time. Uh, yeah, and uh, it wasn't all SpaceX, but you know you, you get the whole. You get the whole thing. It was actually yeah. quite interesting. But he did drop some interesting tidbits about Mars. I mean, the, the basic game plan is like, we're, we're going to uh, send um, a mission to Mars with every Mars opportunity from 2018 onwards. So, and they occur approximately every 26 months. So, um, you know, we, we're, establish, we're establishing cargo flights to Mars that, people, that people can count on uh, for, for cargo. Um, and it's like I said, the, the, the Earth Mars. Orbital rendezvous is only every 26 months. So there's right. one in 2018, there'll be another one in 2020. Um, and I think if things go according to plan, we should be able to uh, should be able to launch people probably in 2024 with arrival in 2025. Soon. Is that is that a, a more certain schedule than United Airlines? <laughs> Well, um, I don't know. Um, well, he there's certainly some United uncertainties Airlines associated with that. <laughs> um, so um, let's. Um, I'm going to show. Anyway, that's the game plan. Like yeah. approximately 2024 to do the first uh, to, to 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 launch the first um, of the Mars and, and colonial you, transport system. I, I want to get back to what you said earlier about a multi. This will be a very big rocket. Okay, a very big, bigger than big. Saturn V. Yes. Tw twice as big, or what? September. I'll tell you. <laughs> Not going to say anything till September? Come on. Very big. <laughs> Come on. Has to be very big. I, it, ha, how big is very big? So big. <laughs> 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 so, uh, A, I, I'm excited for that conference because yes. uh, that's going to be really cool when he yes. announces the Mars architecture. Yes. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the space com nerd community all went, ah! <laughs> Come on! <laughs> and, and then they all kind of went, tell us now! Uh, so, yeah, kind of, right? But the interesting takeaways from that are it sounds like uh, SpaceX is going to be doing um, uh, Dragon runs to uh, Mars starting in 2018. So uh, I'll ask you guys, how viable do you think that is? 2018, starting 2018, and then I guess every time that orbital window opens up, right? So you've got every two years, and I, I believe that window stays open for about two months, if I remember right. Yeah. Thereabouts, depending upon how much uh, how much thrust or how much uh, um, de delta V you have uh, available sure. to yourselves, how much energy can you expend? Um, I guess with my engineering background and how I understand everything with it, uh, twenty twenty five is very optimistic. Okay, That's how I would put it. And you, space I, yeah, I don't feel like twenty twenty five would be doable. So. 
Well, we already kind of talked about part of this infrastructure in, in the episode where we talked about Red Dragon, and I do think that, that it is possible to at least send these unmanned dragons, you know, starting every launch window starting in 2018. But as for sending humans up in 2024, you know, even though I am a huge fan of SpaceX and I like to be just as optimistic as, as Elon is, the fact is that at this current moment, they're about two years behind schedule on a lot of different programs where they would hope to be. You know, they're still not quite at where they need to be for crew Dragon. They're still not where they want to be for Falcon Heavy. That was supposed to launch, you know, a couple of years ago. And, you know, with with kind of the the if, if, if we can look at his predictions, you know, we can definitely trust Elon's predictions a lot more than someone like uh, Richard Branson. But there are <laughs> things that'll happen. Six months. There are things that'll happen that are unforeseen, and you have to, you know, factor in lots of wiggle room there. You know, so I feel like the you know humans on Mars in 2025 plus or minus eight years <laughs> is, 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 yeah. is, is, you mean is plus, a good estimate. You mean plus, not minus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no yeah, minus yeah, no. eight years. <laughs> yeah, somewhere, yeah. In, somewhere in between there to like, you know, I, I think that 2025, like the, the worst case scenario, you know, give eight years to that and that would probably be the first time they do it. And in a good case scenario, they actually do it then or in the next launch window, but... So I think Could happen. A, I think that's a fairly not to knock you both. I think it's a fairly easy answer, right? Just to be like, yes. mm, well, they've missed timelines before, maybe. so they may yes. miss timelines in the future. Obvi that's fairly obviously true. But is this maybe a different situation in that uh, you look at something like Falcon Heavy, and you need to have customers for Falcon Heavy. You need to set it as a priority, and you need to go, okay, this is what makes sense. And you look at you look at SpaceX as a whole, and from the beginning, SpaceX has said Mars. Yes, we're going to Mars. So because Mars has always been the de the thing that they've been pushing for. Does that maybe make this a higher priority or something where they go, no, seriously, this is a thing we're going to do. And so other projects can slide in timeline, whereas this one is more like, no, this is happening. Well, you have to look at the commercial aspect of SpaceX because that is what's kind of funding um, everything with it. And if you want to give up the commercial aspect, that's fine, but then you're going to kind of lose the ability to generate the money to actually make all of that happen. I mean, I know Elon Musk is a billionaire and everything, but even billionaires can run out of money. So uh, it's, mm. it's, you know, the joke, which has already like, happened to him. You, yeah. you know, the, you know, yeah. the, you know, the joke of, of how do you become a millionaire in space? How? Start a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And I, I just feel like, especially with the technical cha challenges of landing on Mars and specifically landing large payloads on Mars, which is what you're going to have to do sure. for a human mission. Um, even though SpaceX is working with NASA on that, I still feel like they're going to have a, a difficult time with that simply simply because there are there are unknowns at the moment. Sure, you've designed everything with Mars in mind, but you haven't flown everything to Mars yet. But aren't they in a better position than Apollo? Consider this, Apollo, JFK makes a speech. At that point, we had never put a human in space. Yeah, they are definitely in a better position technologically in, and in terms of the architecture that's set there and the infrastructure, um, but in terms of SpaceX, Having the knowledge base to actually go to Mars, it's it's not what I would call completely set in stone yet. I guess the best way I'm trying to say it is that... But the timelines are about the same, is what I'm getting at, right? Yeah, So JFK nine does years. his speech, and then it's about nine years. We're about yeah. eight years or so, eight to yeah. nine years. So from having no idea what we're doing mm -hmm. to human walking on the moon, mm -hmm. nine years. Why could we not do the same thing with a Mars architecture? And here's the thing, <laughs> we're not starting from that no idea point. We're starting yes. further down the track. Yes. Budget. B budget, okay, that's Budget, fair. yeah, that's that a good That was the voice of Dutta. Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I Go ahead, SpaceX Mike. does SpaceX does have several Space Act agreements where they have been given pretty much full access to all of NASA's libraries. So all of the data that NASA has been able to acquire over all these years of being able to land things successfully on Mars, SpaceX has information to all of that. And NASA has said that they are going to be actively working with SpaceX to accomplish their goals. And they want to have payloads on that first Red Dragon mission. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're not exactly uh, uh, having to start from scratch here because they have have that huge wealth of information and the support of the agency. So, so yeah. I, what I guess I'm getting at, is it fair to be cautiously optimistic and go, yeah, I mean, there is Elon time, right? Steve Jobs had the reality distortion, <laughs> distortion field. field yeah. Elon has Elon time, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, Elon has Elon time. He's kind of known for that. But 
maybe it doesn't apply this time? Or is that just foolhardy of me to think? And kind of like what you were saying earlier, maybe the reason that some of these other programs have had delays is because of the work that they've been doing on this whole architecture of bringing, bringing mass amounts of people to Mars at once. You know, this will all be announced in September. And yeah. right now, I th yes, it is safe to say that, you know, to be, you know, cautiously optimistic. But once all this plan is announced, who knows, we might actually get to see stuff that's already been worked on this. There might already be a bunch of hardware already existing existing towards this. It's been kept so secret that, you know, that might instill a lot of confidence. So we'll see you then. The other interesting thing in the speech that Elon gave was that he didn't say we're sending a dragon to Mars in 2018. He said we're sending, we're starting in 2018, making it sound like we're going to go 2018, 2020, 2022, 2024, 2026, mm -hmm. right? Those are your available windows, yep. essentially. So this creates a, a, a kind of a new system form, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, you're saying, well, maybe the infrastructure could already be there. They could start building that in 2018, could they not? Well, maybe not super big infrastructure, but, you know. They could start in 2018. Yeah. They, well, I feel like Red Dragon is kind of a test mission. Sure. You know, it's a, t it's a true test flight. It's like, we're going to see if this actually works or not. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it hasn't flown to Mars yet. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen on the, on the cruise to Mars. We don't know how the Dragon is actually going to act when it enters the Mars atmosphere. We don't know... Might if act up, breathe it, fire. It could. Um, we don't know how the retro propulsion is going to work with the specific type of retro propulsion that the Dragon is using. Sure. So, um, so there's, every unknown has to be answered during that mission. Um, or at least as many unknowns as you can think of has to be answered during that mission. Well, um, missions, and, right? Missions, so, so, yeah. The other thing to remember, uh, although SpaceX has not said this, the, these windows are about to, again, you, like you said, you, it's the amount of available power that your rocket has, basically, yes. to dumb that down. So it's how powerful your rocket is mm -hmm. uh, will dictate how long of a window you have. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that they get to launch once in 2018. That's true. They could... I'm not saying they're going to do this, but in theory, on paper, they could launch once per hour for 24 hours. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's an unreasonable thing, right? And just <laughs> constantly send payload until that window closes again. Uh, Carrie Ann, you had a point? Yeah. No, that's that's fine. This is why I never say anything on the show because you always say everything that I was thinking before I have a chance to say it. You just said is the the window should be about two months. Why only send one if you have two months? Uh, you know, SpaceX has, has said that they wanted to uh, up their the cadence of launches in general. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't, not a rocket scientist, uh, but you know, again, in theory, if you had enough rockets, if you had the time, if you had the money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to launch more than one, that just seems like a no-brainer to me. We should point general. out, yeah. we are not privy to any of this information, by the way. So no. we're speculating right around with you guys, right? We have no idea what the plans are, so... Um, right, but like, like that... That's the that's the the probability of chance, right? It's uh, I'm, if I have the chance to take three chances to get the hole in one, sure. I'm going to take all three shots to take, yes. to do the right. hole in one, absolutely, and not just go. I'm sure I only need one chance, right? Right? I mean, that's just that's the law of probability, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's just like in te in test flights, you know, they didn't fly the X-15 once; they flew it 199 times. Just hopefully, so. you learn something every single time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, well, it, Mike, it, it you're did... trying to say something. Sorry, we keep talking over you. Oh, no, 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 no. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, and, and... You, just, you, you just pulled what we usually do and, and said what I was thinking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was also, All right, sorry. give me a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> that was awkward. Um, I also want to say, too, that just because the X-15 flew 199 times doesn't mean every mission in those 199 times was successful right. as well. Yes, but then it goes back to how you define success. Yes. If you lose the vehicle and get no data from it, that's that's, I mean, that's not a success. No. If you lose the data but learn something extremely valuable, is that not successful? Especially um, if it's a test mission. Well, in test, I was going to say in test flights, uh, pushing the envelope and getting that data back is what it's all about. Sure. So yeah. as long as you get the data back, that is a, that is a successful test flight. Right. Mm -hmm. and there's this weird culture of like, I don't, I don't know where this started, but you know, if you lose the vehicle or if something doesn't go exactly as planned, you failed. But you, you haven't failed. These are test and experimental vehicles. Yeah, well, well, there's guess, and we're not saying, I don't know how we got on this track. But in, yeah. I was going to say, in test flights, failure is an option. Yes. But in, in like actual flight missions with humans, failure, no. <laughs> uh, right. Not particularly but a like good option. like the upcoming Blue Origin so. test flight, where they're going to purposefully not have one of the parachutes deployed mm -hmm. correctly. I yeah. mean, these are things that you 
Anyhow, yeah, I don't know how we got off on that. Topic. <laughs> so the thing that I think is exciting, uh, and, and I could be mistaken, but based on these timelines, it it's very, uh, it it harks back to Apollo, I think, just timeline wise, right? About the same amount of time, kind of about the same amount of, okay, that's a big freaking goal, that's a big deal, and uh, I, that's why I'm really excited for uh, what was it, September. August, September? What yes. did you say? September? September. 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 That's why I'm really excited for September because I'm wondering if that's going to be kind of that JFK moment. You yeah. know what I mean? That Because JFK had that, that speech, we choose to go to the moon. Yeah. Um, I don't know what. You don't think... Okay. It, okay. It will be different. It will obviously be different. But I, yeah, because JFK was a good speaker. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> nice. That man signs your checks. Be nice. <laughs> be nice. It'll be different, but I think you, he, you just need that one line. Sure. Right, that thing that that history takes out yeah. and applies to mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah. Right. So. Minnie Stoge is saying September twenty sixth through thirtieth. There you go. Cool. Because she Minnie Stoge is going to be there. Oh, yeah. awesome! Going to be speaking there. You, you should what live are, tweet that for us. Cool what is it? One of, I think she's one of twelve people who are uh, um, doing a presentation. Uh, yeah, that are like uh, international rising space leaders or, or, or something like that. Really, really cool. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm trying to get all my stuff together so that I can just go to the conference. And it would be awesome to see her speak. And, of course, you know, the whole Elon announcement. So, yeah. Trying. All right. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, are you excited about this? Uh, are, are, do you think it's uh, reasonable timelines? Oh, you are? I, I, I love being excited, especially if I get proven wrong. That's what I love too. Hmm. I love to be proven wrong on stuff like this. So. Well, yes, but you, you, well, yeah, <laughs> I think I think everyone would be like, "Yay, made the timelines!" Yeah, uh, woo! But do you think? What do you think? Do you think they'll make the timelines, um, or is Elon time kicking in here and <laughs> off by? You know, it's generally about two years, right? Elon time's about two years, so off by about two years. But even at two years, that yeah. still puts Mars well within our lifetime, well within yeah. our grasp. Finally, I mean, that's, that's that's kind of exciting. We did so, it, did, not right? So, did, have we? I mean, how close are we? Obviously, we're going to learn a lot more later this year. But what do you think right now? Uh, are yes. you excited? Did this announcement make you excited? What do you think? Leave your comments: YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you want to leave them. Speaking of comments, we've got comments from last week's show. We're going to talk about those up next. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. These are premier members. We've also got our producers. They've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. As well as our Patreon Plus subscribers. They've contributed $2.50 or more to this 
There we go. A specific episode. I heard him mashing on the keyboard in the background. Uh, now, at this level and above, so that our plus, our producers, and our premiere members, they're going to also get access to After Dark as soon as we post it online, as well as the Google Hangouts. But wait, there's more. We've also got our patrons. These are people who have contributed anywhere between one penny and two dollars and forty-nine cents. So as little as one penny gets your name in the show. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow and keep us going week after week, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Getting right around that time where we need to do another one of the uh, hangouts. And I think what's gonna happen, we're gonna be off for a chunk of July, uh, most of July. So I think what we'll do is um, we'll schedule it somewhere in there, like, uh, cause we're gonna be moving places, so. We'll uh, we'll figure it out. Maybe just use iPhones. It'll be totally ghetto, but uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it'll be neat. Um, ghetto? And, yeah. Well, I mean, because we're moving to the ghetto. That's... No, it's it's because he's on Android now, and he thinks that iPhones are ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> Something. Uh, it, it'll be it, it'll be um, qu a questionable broadcast. <laughs> How about that? Ben is prissy. What? You are. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started with our comments from last week's show. Uh, up first. This one comes from Doug Space off of TMRO.TV. Ooh, our website. It says, uh, with proper planning, how many of the things that we'll miss could we provide? Consider a large inflatable, inflatable habitat with plenty of greenery inside. Or consider a refrigerator with a variety of meats. Consider hanging out for an hour overlooking Yosemite using a VR headset, etc. Uh, what was our hashtag last week? Uh, Mars, Mars lifestyle. lifestyle. Mars lifestyle. Yeah, that was it. I'm like, hmm, this needs context. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you actually, that's an interesting idea. We could use VR, but then at the same point, you could probably use VR in reverse too, right? So you could send rovers and get. Although I think we're starting to do that, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. So you can actually like from um, Curiosity and whatnot. Um, I think just. Grab yeah, it. they do use VR to plan out drives and stuff for yeah. uh, the rovers. And they've, yeah. they've actually been, do they did that with the Mars Exploration rovers as well. So it's actually not a new thing, at least at JPL. So. Yeah, but I'm wondering how, but I believe that's actually available to the muggles so that we can yes. also experience Mars. That actually may, might be kind of a fun, cool. Yeah. I've got a Gear VR headset over there. I should do that next We should dark. play with it in yeah. After Dark. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> up next. Uh, this one comes from uh, X Aerodynamics off of Patreon. Ooh, a patron patron comment. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always one small thing missing when working on a project or requiring a trip to the hardware store. There are few Home Depots on Mars, so that little thing may be a major frustration. <laughs> <laughs> there are few, not a few. There are few. In other words, there's not a Home Depot or a Lowe's or whatever you might need. Yes. Uh, yeah, but that's where the 3D printer comes into play, right? You yeah. just print whatever part you need. Unless, unless you need a part you can't print. We need to figure out how to print like everything. Like an extra liver or something. Well, although I don't know, aren't we printing body parts now? We are. Yeah, yeah so, you can 3D print body parts. Yeah, that I think that's a printable thing. Uh, you, we can 3D print meat. Um, we can 3D print metal parts. We can 3D print plastic parts. What can't we 3D print? Mm -hmm. Pizza. Pizza. No, they have. So I did see a report like a year ago that they that they uh, but 3D the problem printed is, a pizza. So here's what I don't want. I don't want my pizza 3D printer, my meat 3D printer, my metal parts 3D printer. My they, we need to find a way to kind of wrap some of these so you've got like your tissues 3D right, printer. Right, because I your... want accidentally my pizza to come out as a liver. <laughs> liver pizza. Yum. <laughs> Think about that for liver just a and half onions second. pizza. Absolutely not. Why can't I have titanium pizza? But, you know, with the 3D printer, sure, you can make all those things, but it's whether or not you have the, the raw materials to make those different things or not. That's true, too. Although, hopefully, yeah. Mars has the raw materials necessary. We can mine whatever we need on Mars to build whatever we need to build whatever we need. Plenty of iron. There you go. Plenty all right, next up. Size, so. <laughs> Great for liver. Uh, this <laughs> one so it comes from <laughs> Tom Core off of YouTube. The name of a star system is named usually after the central star or the opposite. And since our system has its star Sol, known as Sun, we named it the Solar System. Uh-huh. What? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I got the Jeez. death stare from Jared on that one. Uh, so I think this was from last week when you were doing your astrology. Um... Can you astronomy? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I got that confused For again. For Pete's sake, I, I got that confused again. Oops, oops, <laughs> completely innocent mess up. Um. You should just table flip and walk off. 
<laughs> Someday, way, my, I, I, can you tell me my Aquarius out. horoscope? I'm out. Jared, he's come out. back. I need my Aquarius horoscope. <laughs> <laughs> you know where you can get it, Space Mike? <laughs> Uh, all right. Kidding, that, you, so John Cora, that is that is fair enough. Yes. Although I always want, I feel like the astronomy community uh, has terrible names for things that are boring, and they could they could do better. And I personally blame you. Okay. All right. I'm next, fine with that. Next up. Wow. Uh, also off of YouTube, this comes from Basile Collard or Collard, I suppose. I'm wondering if it can be possible to build an inflatable propellant gas tank. It could be great to reduce the overall weight of spacecrafts. To go further, we could imagine an inflatable structure with two or three main layers, the first for people who live in, the others at the outside of, to store propellant, and to protect people from solar radiation and do only one micrometeorite shield for both functionalities. Huh, interesting. And the answer, and the answer is yes, you absolutely can. The yep. old old Atlas rockets used uh, kind of inflatable balloons on the inside for the propellant tanks. <laughs> yeah, the Centaur upper stages for those. Yeah, you had to keep them pressurized or else, uh, you know, they kind of collapsed. And there's actually yeah. a really cool video, if you can find it online on YouTube, um, of a test flight that they were, they were like getting an Atlas ready to go on, a, on a, a stand out at Vandenberg and they lost the pressurization in the Centaur while it was being fueled and it like the rocket like folds in half and then falls and like sp spills its kerosene everywhere and it's <laughs> I have one of the most that amazing that sounds that's amazing. terrible yeah uh, <laughs> uh, I wish I had known that we would have rolled that in the show that sounds amazing let's, do, let's roll it next week <laughs> just randomly <laughs> or let's just find it in after dark and we can roll it there uh, that's true. or something all right, and there next up, uh, uh, finally, actually, last one. The last one actually comes off of our Slack channel from Grumpy Space. Which means also a patron. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just now got around to watching last Saturday's show. I always crack up when Ben says something to their Alexa and mine tries to comply also. This week you added wood to my shopping list. Thanks, Ben Credible. Well, you're welcome. Wood. Anything I can do. Alexa, I tell me a joke. said. It didn't work, at least not on ours. Hopefully it worked <laughs> on yours. <laughs> Everyone else's Alexa right now is telling some really crappy joke. Alexa, buy everything in the shopping cart. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, wait, what did you just do? I have no idea. <laughs> Someone's really pissed at me right now. Yeah, you might be really pissed at you right now. I'm gonna have to go check my shopping cart. On that note, uh, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next week. There's 14 items! Saved in that car! <laughs> <laughs>